When the Buddha teaches wisdom or discernment, he always talks about things that are in pairs. For instance, there's one teaching where he says, a sign of wisdom is when you know which duties fall to you and which ones don't. It means there's a distinction. There's some things you've got to work on, some things you've got to do, and other things you have to put aside. You have to accept them for what they are and leave them alone, because they're not really your duty. One of John Lee's most famous Dharma talks is one that he gave to one of his students as she was dying. And he talked about the distinction between strength of body and strength of mind. That even though we have to try to maintain the body as best we can, take good care of it, so we can get the best use out of it, still there comes a point where you have to let it go. It's going to have to deteriorate. Even as you're taking good care of it, you find that it does things without asking your permission, without warning you, and you have to learn to accept that there are new limitations. But strength of mind doesn't have to go that way. Strength of mind is something you can develop even up to your last breath. Strength of conviction, strength of your persistence, strength of mindfulness concentration, discernment. These are things you can keep working on, and you're going to need them, too. Sometimes we like to think as life reaches its end, things get easier. After all, we're not as strong as we were. It's time to rest. But actually, some of our most difficult decisions are made. Some of the biggest challenges we have to face come at that time. I've been reading some biographies of biographies of famous people in French history as a way of working on my French. I'm struck time and again by how their lives don't get easier as they reach their end. They actually get a lot harder, both inside and outside. You'd think that people would let up. they say, oh, so-and-so is an old man, an old woman now, let, let them be. But no. That's when people come in for the attack. And that's outside. Inside, it's the same sort of thing. As you begin to realize that things are winding down, and you're going to have to leave a lot of things in this life, the mind reacts. There can be very strong greed, very strong aversion, a very strong sense of helplessness and weakness. And that's something we can't give in to. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to develop strengths of mind, so that whatever choices we have to make, we'll make well. There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha is giving advice to one of his students on how to give advice to someone who's dying. And as I say, the first thing you've got to watch out for is worries, things you're concerned about, worried about, that someone's not going to handle this, someone's not going to handle that. You tell the person, look, you're dying. This is not time to be worried about that. Focus on what your real duty is right now, which is looking after the state of your mind. And that the person who's dying is concerned about the central pleasures of the human life. You say, don't worry about that. Think about that there are better, better pleasures in the higher levels, the deva realms. And once the person gets his mind set on the deva realms, then you tell him, okay, there's the Brahma realms, even higher based on infinite goodwill, infinite compassion, infinite empathetic joy, infinite equanimity. Set your mind on that. There you are, the body's falling apart. You're supposed to set your mind on things like this. And then beyond that, if the person can get his mind on that, then the Buddha says, well, remind him that even in the Brahma realms there is a sense of self-identity. You're identifying with things. And it's possible to let that go. This is a big challenge, letting go of this tendency we have in the mind to want to identify with something, 
we hope for happiness, and we think one of the ways of finding happiness is to identify, well, what will be happy, and what do I have in my control that I can manipulate so I can bring that happiness about. We identify with those things. And the Buddha said, you know, we have, in order to find true happiness, in order to get totally beyond suffering, we have to let go of that too. Here again, the body's falling apart and you're asked to do something really challenging. Otherwise the mind just goes in line with whatever flow of whatever comes up. The untrained mind doesn't know what to do at a time like that. It just kind of thrashes around, grabs at this, grabs at that. And that's not what you want. Because all too often when we grab at things, it's just whatever is nearby. They have a phrase in Thai, yata kam, means you're just in line with your old karma. And the phrase usually describes you know, just things going downhill. So what we need to do is develop strengths in mind and realize that there are going to be choices that have to be made. We'll have to make distinctions between what's a wise choice and what's a foolish choice, a skillful choice or an unskillful choice. So on the one hand, you have to be prepared. Just prepare yourself in terms of your attitude, that there will be times when you have to make difficult choices. And you can't depend on the strength of the body at that point because the body is falling apart. You'll have to depend on the strength of your mind. And once you've got the right attitude, then you work on the skills that are going to be needed. Having conviction, one, that the choices you make will really make a difference. If your attitude is, well, it doesn't really matter, I'll just go with whatever, then it's hard to gather the strength that you need in order to make what might be a difficult choice. So first you've got to be convinced that your actions do make a difference. And then you have to develop the perception that you've got to make an effort. You hold that in mind, and you have to keep these things in mind even though things are rumbling around in the body. It's like being in a ship going down. You have to remember, what did, what did you learn about getting into the lifeboats? What did you learn about how to behave when things like that are happening? And then you stir that up inside you. You stay focused on what has to, has to be done. That's what concentration is for. And then you try to use your discernment as best you can as to what would be the wise course to take when things come up that are not in the, in the instruction manual. Say when the ship goes down, it goes down at a different angle than you thought. You thought you could get out the right side. Well, no, the right side is sinking, so you've got to go out the left side. Learn how to look at the situation and make your choices. These are the strengths you'll need. These are the strengths we develop as we meditate. The whole reason why we meditate is to get the mind under our control so that we make a choice, we can stick with it. If we make a foolish choice, then we can realize, okay, we've got to change that. So this is why meditation is proactive. There is that instruction the Buddha gives to Rahula before he teaches in breath meditation, make your mind like earth. Telling basically to be non-reactive in the same way that the earth doesn't react when you pour garbage on it. But he's not saying to stop there. The amount of acceptance that we need is simply the amount that admits that whatever is here is here. So you can do something skillful with it. Because then the Buddha goes on and teaches breath meditation, and his steps in breath meditation are proactive. Try to breathe in a way where you're aware of the whole body. Notice the effect that the breath has on the body. Breathe in a way that feels refreshing, feels pleasant, 
and then allow those feelings of pleasure and refreshment to settle down, allow the breath to settle down. Now there's some allowing here, but there's also some directing. We don't just sit with whatever comes up. You ask yourself, what's going on right now? What needs to be brought into balance? If the mind is feeling a low energy level, well, what can you do to bring the level of energy up? If it's feeling scattered and wired, distracted, what can you do to make it more steady as you breathe in, as you breathe out? How can you calm the mind down? How can you release the mind from things that are burdening it? When you think about it, the Buddha's instructions for breath meditation are basically questions, focusing your attention on what can be done. All too often he doesn't give very precise instructions. This is why we look, say, into the teachings of the Forest of Johns. Like John Lee gives very precise instructions on how to develop a sense of well-being, a sense of fullness, and then how to let it spread through the body. But even with his instructions, there are still questions that are raised. How do you do that? How do you do this? If you run into a problem, what do you do? And this is where you have to develop your own discernment. As you can follow the instructions, and they can take you only so far. But then you have to look at what you've done and learn how to choose wisely between what needs to be changed what needs to be left alone. In other words, the instructions are not foolproof. After all, if you had foolproof instructions, you can complete them and still be a fool. The Buddha is giving the kind of instructions that make you more discerning, make you wiser. He points out areas that are worth exploring, gives you some tips. But the particulars are what you're going to find as you explore, and your ingenuity in figuring out how to explore. That will depend on you. So this is where you have to put your effort in, and this is how concentration develops your effort, your strength of effort. So when things are not going well in the body as you're meditating, you don't get discouraged. You don't feel defeated. You tell yourself, here's, here's a challenge. And you take the meditation as a challenge, and that develops the right attitude. Remember what the Buddha said about the qualities he developed that he needed for his awakening. He had to be heedful, he had to be ardent, he had to be resolute. Resolute is that quality of mind where you're up for a challenge. Heedful is remembering that your actions do make a difference. And so ardent means that you try to do the best you can. And then the resolution comes in again, that you, you stick with it, stick with it regardless. So life is not just a matter of just accepting things as they are and letting them flow, and which is why meditation is not a matter of just accepting things as they are and letting them flow. You have to be more proactive. As the Buddha said, you have to learn how to direct yourself well. Give yourself a goal. In this case, the goal is to live well. And when you have to die, you want to die well die without creating suffering for yourself. Die in a way that if your practice isn't complete yet, that you'll be able to die and go to a place where you can make further progress on your path. It'll be challenging, but you learn from the meditation to be up for challenges. You learn not to get discouraged. You remember the example of all the great noble ones who have gone before us. They've been able to solve these problems. And as the Buddha said, you want to have the attitude, they can do it, you can too. And let that thought give you strength. And let the practice of your meditation make that thought a reality. 
and not just a hope.